program today. And those of you who are joining us by internet from, let's see, how do they say it? From sea to shining sea, coast to coast, and all the ships at sea. Welcome to Chestnut Community Church. We're glad to have you here today uh, joining us as we worship on this ninth day of January. Where has the year gone? <laughs> it is gone. We're, uh, uh, yeah, there's just a few more days till Christmas and we'll be uh, running right along. We're glad to have those of you who are here here. We have several who are down and uh, really not doing well. Mike and Beverly are watching us on the internet. Uh, they're both coughing like silly. Uh, we've got Iris and uh, Randy watching us. Uh, Randy, we hope you get to feeling a lot better and that Iris is taking good care of you. Uh, we know that Tom is still not doing well. He's still uh, queasy on his feet, but we're glad that Becky is taking good care of him. Uh, Randy Hales is sick. Uh, he had to go to Bonham to get an infusion similar to what I had, uh, but he's still down. So we've got a lot of folks who are ill. Be careful, people. Uh, whether you are vaccinated or not, it's really irrelevant at this point in the game. Just be careful. We don't want you getting sick, and uh, we're seeing a huge uptick at our hospital. In fact, we had 79 staff members who were not able to work because they tested positive for COVID. This last week, 79. Uh, that's a bunch when you think that uh, our med surge department has a model level of 63. Uh, this week, they had 30 people to work in that department. That's half, and that's med surge. That's surgical type people, people who are really, uh, really need to be there and on top of their game, and they're not able to be. Uh, so we want to make sure that they are taken care of. Make sure you're taken care of. Be very, very careful. You can't be too careful. Uh, our COVID in our hospital at Texoma Medical Center, we were down to like three patients uh, back before Christmas. Uh, Friday, when we got our count, we had 54 that were in isolation. So it's coming back. Now, will it follow the South African model and surge and then go to nearly nothing? We don't know. But then heart attacks are killing people. Uh, liver cancers are killing people. Hepatitis A and B, C. diff, all kinds of nasty bugs are out here. But there's a good thing to that. It doesn't matter how critical the disease, God overrides it. And we have to continually put our trust in Him. Uh, we'll be in 1 John chapter 1 today and then next week, uh, 1 John chapter 2, we'll look at that. Thursday night, Victor begins his series on holiness in hostile times. Yeah, and uh, you'll be preaching next Sunday here. The next Sunday. I'll be preaching next Sunday. Don't let me forget that. Yeah, remind me. I'd, boy, that'd be terrible to wake up in the morning and say, oh, goodness, what am I going to say tomorrow? But uh, we're looking forward to all of that. We've got several that we need to be praying for. Good to see many of you back today. Ron's here. we got Judy over here. Uh, just glad to have Steve and uh, Jan back from... Cain Tuckay, uh, I got it close to right, didn't I? Uh, but we're glad to have all of you here. We're going to pray and ask the Lord's blessing upon our service, and Matthew will come and lead us uh, as we sing. Join me as I pray. Father, you know the rising and the downsetting of each of us. You've written our names in your book, and you have determined our days. In your sovereignty you know what is going to be our future so Lord that's why we can push on with confidence and joy knowing that you know 
and that you're not going to leave us alone. Father, thank you so much for your love and your presence with us today. Thank you for our Lord Jesus who gave his life on the cross. We could have life together. And now, Father, join us as we sing. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. Let's praise the Lord this morning. We're going to sing at the cross, at the cross. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done, he groaned upon the tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well might the sun in darkness hide, he shut his glories in. When Christ the mighty maker died, for men the creatures sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. On the last. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Self away, tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, Sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, full as to stand before the throne. On Christ. 
Open your Bible, please, to 1 John and chapter 1. 1 John and chapter 1. And I'll tell you how foggy my brain is. Before we sang that first song, I was going to tell you a little story about Fanny Crosby. Now, uh, Fanny Crosby did not write that song at the cross. Isaac Watts did. Isaac wrote it in 1674. Wow. Can you imagine verses lasting over that period of time? And in 1850, well over 200 years, or right at 200 years, Fanny Crosby was in an old arbor meeting. She heard the altar call after that song, and she started to weep. Now, Fanny Crosby was blind, didn't have any eyesight. A mustard plaster put on by an old doctor took her sight when she was just a little girl. But she heard the music, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die. Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Now, we've changed the words. For sinner such as I is how we say it. But it was originally written by Isaac Watts, for such a worm as I. Here's what she said. I surrendered myself to the Savior, and my very soul flooded with celestial Light. I sprang to my feet shouting hallelujah and folks tried to quieten me down. 
but they haven't. <laughs> Fanny Crosby, she's written many, many, many hymns. Isaac Watts, 1600s. Fanny Crosby, 1800s. And she said, light flooded my soul. Now, on the front of the bulletin, it says God is light. So you're in John chapter 1. Let's read a few verses. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, oh, by the way, if you do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And we're going to stop there. There was a book written back when uh, we just got married, about 1973, we got married before that, but the guy's name was Menninger, Carl Menninger. And the title of his book rattled the Christian community because the title of his book, Whatever Became of Sin. And he wrote probably what is as scathing a book against Christianity and preachers as could be written. He said, what happened to sin? We don't call it sin anymore. It's no longer adultery. It's now an affair. Ooh. That sounds like a party, doesn't it? It's no longer murder. It's now unfortunate death. Oh. Let me read just a little bit of what he said. In all of the laments and reproaches made by our seers and prophets, one misses a mention of sin, a word which used to be a veritable watchword of the prophets. It was a word once in everyone's mind, but now rarely if ever heard. Does that mean that sin is involved? That no sin is involved in our trouble? Sin with an I in the middle? Is no one any longer guilty of anything? Guilt, perhaps, of a sin that could be repented and repaired and atoned for? Is it only that someone may be stupid or sick or criminal or asleep? Wrong things are being done, we know. Tares are being sown in the wheat field every night. But no one is responsible. No one answerable for these heinous acts. Anxiety and depression, we all acknowledge. And even vague guilt feelings. But no one has committed any sin. Where indeed did sin go? That was his opening in page 13. He was just getting started. I mean, he went through the whole book. What happened to sin? What happened to darkness? Well, it became customary. We no longer 
are guilty because of our sin, we now blame others for our sin. Have you heard that before? Oh, it's not the economy, it's the former president. It's not the bug out here, it's uh, uh, the Chinese. There's the, they're the ones that did it. And everybody is blaming somebody else. No one is taking responsibility for anything. And that's why John comes out very strongly, I think. This is the message, verse 5, we have from him to proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. No darkness. So where did sin come from? Well, I don't have a whole lot of time to develop that eight-hour course. But I do have time to say this. Sin came because men and women and boys and girls do not want to accept responsibility for their own action. You know, I blame genes and uh, uh, family history and all kinds of things for my loss of hair and my excelled weight, and my asthma. It's not my fault. <laughs> it's not my fault that I'm overweight. It's not my fault that I'm losing my hair. I used to scratch my head all the time, and that's where it's gone. Uh, I am getting stronger. I've now been uh, 26 days in my exercise program, Tara. 26 days, and I'm getting stronger. I can now lift a whole pork roast. From the cooker to the plate. <laughs> Used to, I had to break it up, but I could do the whole thing. You know. <sighs> it's not my fault, God. The woman thou gavest me. That's what Adam said. It's not my fault, God. The serpent enticed me, Eve said. And the devil just giggled. We've been passing the buck, we've been passing the blame, and we have not been walking in the light. 1 John verse, chapter 1, verse 5 is the basis for 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 through 2, 2, and it's the foundation for everything up to chapter 3, verse 10. It's the basis. God is light. Where is he light? Well, only in this uh, God blessed USA, right? No, he's the light of Japan. He's the light of Israel, if they'll accept it. He's the light of Iran and Afghanistan and Africa and South America and every other continent, every other people in the world. God is light, and He's not diminished. He is continually light. He is giving light. And John goes through a series of uh, what we would call prose points. He says, if we say, verse 6, verse 8, verse 10, uh, and then three or four times after that. Nine times John uses the word sin nine times in this passage uh, or in his book. Twice in this passage he uses darkness. Now I had a music director up in Missouri who was also a printer. And he would uh, develop uh, these sheets for long term print. He had to do it in his dark room. He had a sign on that dark room. Do not open this door. You'll let the darkness get out. And I thought that was funny. Oh, that's just hysterical. The darkness didn't get out. The darkness was overcome by light. And he said, yeah, but if I put that, they'd think I was preaching. And he didn't want to do that. Bless his heart, little Tommy. Uh, but we have here an atoning sacrifice. Here we have a God who recognizes light to be integral. Do you remember what God said to start? Light be. Now it's translated, let there be light. 
But when you look at the Hebrew, it's very, very powerful. Light be. Huh. And it was done. It was done. God just had to speak it and light occurred. From whence came the light? Well, God is light. All of a sudden, the darkness had to give way to the brilliance of the eternal God. The uh, New English Translation says, Now this is the gospel message we have heard from Him. Let me tell you, not only is Jesus Christ from the beginning, not only is He the Word of life, the eternal life, the Father, Son, the source of fellowship, and the source of joy, He is light for everyone. Have you ever sat at home in the olden days and watched as the sun would come through the window and you could see the dust particles floating in the light. You ever see that? And we'd blow and we'd try to get them to stir up and then mom came in and asked us what we were doing and we told her and you know what she did? Gave us some pledge and a rag to dust our room. Made us work. Such to the point that we couldn't see the particles anymore. The closer we got to the light, the more we could see. Now, I get up in the morning and it's dark. And I look out the back window and it's dark. And I try to put on my pants and it's dark. And I nearly fall over two or three times. It's dark. But then after a little bit, the light starts to come and I can see my shoes now. I can't tell what color they are. I might have a brown and a... Nope, I'm right this morning. Uh, you never can tell. But the closer you get to the light, the more you can see around you. The more you can experience. The more joy you can behold. God is light. And it's embedded in the faithful gospel proclamation. You know, the word light occurs over 275 times in Scripture. 95 times in the New Testament. So there's something important about light. And I think we may have missed the whole point. I'm just going to read about four or five or nine passages real quick. They're not going to appear on your screen. If you want a copy of this, email me, rickhargrave at gmail.com. And I will send it to you. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Psalm 27, 1. What is your life's fountain? In your light we shall see light. Psalm 36, 9. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Isaiah 60. I always thought that just something my mother made up. But no. Arise and shine. Well, I can arise, but I guarantee I don't shine very well. Uh, early on. Nations will come to your light, Isaiah 60. The sun will no longer be light by day, and the brightness of the moon will not shine on you, but the Lord will be your everlasting light, Isaiah 60, 19. Micah 7, 8, the Lord is my light. John 1, 9, the true light who gives to everyone who is coming into the, was coming into the world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. John 8, 12. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. John 12. I have come as light into the world. John 12, 46. God came. Isaiah 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on the living in the land of darkness, we have a message to announce to a world in darkness. And that message is, God is light. God can bring light to your life. He can bring light to your discouragement. He can bring light to your disappointment. He can bring light to your despair. He can bring light out of your darkness. And the darkness cannot overcome the light. But this is the truth we have to affirm. In God there is no darkness 
None. Now, double, double negative is bad grammar, but it's good theology. There is no darkness in God. None. Not any. God is so holy that even his eyes cannot look upon sin. His holiness is such that everything he does is light and is brightness. Have you noticed that there's a new phrase in some uh, advertising nowadays? We want to be transparent. We don't want to hide anything. Our pound and a half hamburger is pure hamburger meat. Well, <laughs> I guess that's right, but I got a bone the other day at the McDonald's. It, 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 they, they ground it up and they missed something. I don't know what it was. But have you ever bit down on a hamburger expecting it to melt in your mouth and it cracks your tooth? That's not good. So, double negatives. John 1, 4. Life was in him and the life was the light of men. John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness but will have the light of life. And then here in John First John, God is light. See, you're repeating that a lot. I think we need to remember it. God is light when my finances are not what they ought to be. God is light when my health is not up to par. God is light when I have to do things that absolutely repulse me. God is light. Regardless of my situation, He comes and brings it to me. So, what do we need to know about what God says about light? He is light. Total, complete light. Martin Luther said there is no darkness in Him, not even the slightest. There's no dark side to this God. No. No. Leave that alone. There is a non-negotiable tenet in faithful theology and faithful gospel presentation. One tenet, that God can take your sin, which is black and ugly and dark, and He can turn it into light, something dynamic and powerful. John Falconer, an old... Uh, missionary said I have but one candle of life to burn and I would rather burn it out in a land filled with darkness than in a land flooded with light and he went on to be a missionary with peoples that we will never see C.T. Studd some want to live within the sound of a church or a chapel bell I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell, he said. And he went on to win countless thousands to Christ on a mission field because he was willing to take the light and go where the darkness was. We're talking about global evangelism that starts at home. How many people around you know that God is light by your life is there an imminent light coming from your home or is there turmoil and chaos god is light we need to know what the world we need to, the world to know what god says about sin hmm. we've talked about the light but in a real sense the essence of sin is us taking charge of what God should be running. We become the boss. That's sin. We make our own decisions without consulting Him. That is sin. We want to be in charge. We want to establish the ground rules so that it's effective for us. We want to provide our own definition of what light is and what wrong is, and what sin is and is not. 
I used to say jokingly, but probably there was a little laughter to that. What is gluttony for some is just a good meal for us others. Think about it. You rationalize. It's okay if I do this, but don't you dare do it. Sin is me taking charge of what God should be in charge of. That's bad grammar too, isn't it? Yeah. Do you get the, get the picture? Sometimes we have to say, my goodness, human opinions don't matter when it comes to sin. I don't care what you think your life is all about. I don't care what you call right and what you call wrong. There are some things that are just wrong. Now, I don't know if you've been watching Jeopardy or not, but there's some things going on on that show that are just wrong. I mean, in, in more ways than one, it's just wrong. And, and there are things in this world that we, in a chaplain's position, are forced to acknowledge but not accept, but we must acknowledge that there are people who do not want a representative of the Lord in their room. We ask them when they check in, do you have a religious preference? Well, I'm a Christian. Well, that's what they'll type down. Now, I think I've told you before, but when we were in Israel once uh, uh, with the uh, traumatic loss group, we visited the synagogue, and here's the chief rabbi. Beard, hat, black, the whole thing. I've got a picture. Uh, we said, what do you think a Christian is? And he said, here's the way we see it as Jews. Billy Graham is a good Christian. Marilyn Monroe is an unfortunate Christian. Hitler was a bad Christian. That's their opinion. So when you say you're a Christian, that really doesn't mean a lot anymore. I, I tend to use the phrase, I'm a follower of Jesus. That's different. But we come to a point where what I say about sin just doesn't count. What does God say? Let's hear his mind on the matter. Verses 6 and 7, look at that. If, now you can just take your pencil and highlight these. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all misfortune. Is that what your Bible says? No, mine says sin. Cleanses us from all sin. And we have to call it that. We have to call sin what it is. It is contrary to God. So don't lie to everybody. Don't lie to them. Because if we say we have fellowship with God and we're mad about some people in the church and we decide to go to another church because we want to go to a better church and then we stay there a couple of years and we get mad at somebody there and we go to another one. I know a family who's been a member of every church in McKinney, nearly, every Baptist church. They just get mad and move. And I was at one place long enough that they came back around. They ran out of the others and they found out we were the lesser of two of eight evils. I don't get it, folks. If we say we have fellowship with God and don't have fellowship with one another, we're liars. That used to be gun drawing time, right? You called me a liar, Slim. I did, Bubba. What you going to do about it? Well, I'm going to draw. That's an old, I don't know that that dialogue ever took place. But you understand what I'm saying. Those are fighting words. Don't call me a liar. What do you mean I'm a liar? Well, I am. All of us are. If we say we have fellowship with the Father and don't have fellowship with each other. 
you got something wrong, you don't like something about your your fellow believers, then uh, you better be careful because we do not practice. Uh, we lie, we don't practice, we don't live the truth. If we walk in darkness, walk is a present tense, and it means continuous and consistent in pattern of life. Oh, I'm great. Yeah, Sunday morning I'll shake your hand, I'll hug your neck, I'll do all that thing with a mask on clearly. But I'll do it and we'll love each other and when I get out of here, before I get to the restaurant, I'm already telling my wife how nasty you smell and how ugly you are and how opposed to everything I am that you do. And we just nitpick people to death. Verse 7, in contrast, if we live our lives in the realm of light, we do have fellowship one with another. How can we do that? The blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. There it is. We just have to recognize it. Martin Luther it is strange that although we preach about the blood and the suffering of Christ every year, yet we see so many sects bursting forth, S-E-C-T-S, at least you mispronounce my word. Oh, the great darkness of the past, but if we cling to the word, that which has been made known, we have this treasure which is the blood of Christ clinging to the word hanging on to the blood allowing sin to be confessed up to date you ever tried to justify or reconcile your bank account after not doing it for four different months in a row it's almost impossible it's not impossible for some of you who have a brain like that. But for Ricky, I could count my money from my paper route four times and get five answers. It, it was horrible. So I just didn't worry about it anymore. It drove my mother crazy. But I can't justify having a believer not confessing sin, not keeping their accounts up to date, by holding grudges, by being everything that we're not supposed to be as opposed to what we should be. Don't lie to yourself. Verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Oh, my but I thought the blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sin. It does. But we have a backyard that's messed up at our house. We've had digging out there and it's muddy and bless the dog's heart. He's trying to go outside. And he goes outside and he does what dogs typically do. Julie said the other day he was out there, dug a hole, and laid down in it, out there in the dirt. Well, I would never have known that had I not looked at the floor. Dog came in with dirt all over the house. I got out my little swiffer, swiffer, swifter thing, the thing with a pad on it, and here I went. I just started following the dog, cleaning up mud, cleaning up dirt, picking it all up, and I had a pile. You had put it in your hand where the dog had brought in the dirt. Now, we cleaned the dog. We can put the dog in the shower. We can soap him up, make him look really neat, blow dry his hair, comb his little, the little hairs up over his eyes. and He looks like a cute little beagle. And guess what? Back out the door he goes, in the mud, back in the house, bringing in dirt. But you just cleaned the dog. Yes, we did. Oh, Ricky Lee. 
How many times have I failed you, Lord? Cleanse me, and God does. In fact, verse 9 says, If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But guess what? I go back in the yard. I get back in the dirt. And I have to confess again. I had one very fine insurance salesman deacon in Missouri. <laughs> fine guy. Told me one day, he said, when I confess my sin to God, that meant I never have to do it again. And he didn't. As far as I can tell, he uh, the only time I saw him cry was when one of our older fellows came and was saved. And he shed one tear, wiped it off, and off he went. Folks, if you haven't been on your knees confessing sin in the last month, you're about 30 days short. That ought to be a morning and an evening ritual. Wake up in the morning and as foggy as my head is, I still take a breath and remember that this is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. When I lay down to go to sleep, and I go to sleep pretty quick, I'll turn the TV on and I'll miss the last quarter of the football game because I'm sound gone. But before I do, before I close my eyes, I say, Lord, I have sinned today. Purge me, O oh Lord, and know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me and restore to me the joy of my salvation. And I go to sleep. Listen, people. We must contrast our lives as light with those who do not know Christ as in darkness. And that's everybody who does not know Him. Light and dark cannot co coexist. Don't lie to yourself. John gives us this, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And then he says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And then in verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the word is not in us. You'll say, man, that is convoluted logic. If I have sinned, I confess my sin. But then if I come back and say I have no sin, I've made him a liar. And what is he talking about? Nothing more than the basic nature of us. We live in a life of sin. We live in an area where we can do nothing but sin. Even if we're believers. Uh, I made a fruit salad for our family. And our, uh, uh, when we had our Christmas thing. I like fruit salad. I peeled an orange, sectioned that orange, got all the seeds out, cut it into three pieces each section, put it in the bowl. My hands were a little bit yucky, so I washed them off and I peeled three bananas. And I chopped up those bananas and put them in the bowl. And had an apple or two over there, honey crisp always. Peeled that honey crisp apple and chopped that thing up, made sure no seeds or pith was in there. And I put those apples in there and had cherries in the refrigerator. And I got some cherries out for a little color. Put the cherries in there, made sure there were no stones in that, in that cherry. And then I put some pineapple in there. Oh, the citrus, you just can't beat it. And I offered that bowl of fruit salad to the family and they noticed that in the peeling and cutting, I had cut my hands, didn't know it, 
and a blood had dripped in that salad. Y'all want any salad? Let me tell you, I don't care how many good works you put in that salad. It's contaminated because I touched it. And I had those sores, I had those cuts on my hand. Everything we touch is tainted by the flesh. And we have to constantly, Paul said, I buffet myself. I beat myself so that I will not be disqualified. I live constantly in fear of unconfessed sin because I know that's the only thing that can derail my walk in the Spirit of God. We can't lie about God. Um, We must recognize that God is so holy we have to confess our sin. But the world needs to know what God says about Jesus. We know what God says about confession. He told us. We know what God says about sin. He told us. We know what God says about himself, but we need to make sure the world knows that. Very quickly, he is our advocate. Verse 1 of chapter 2. My little children. That's a term of endearment, fatherly concern, and he uses it several times in his book. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but, you see that? If anyone does sin, by the way, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now in three verses here, he's told us that we can be cleansed of sin. He then tells us that we are still walking in a world that's polluted and we have to continually confess our sin. And if we don't sin or we think we don't, but we do, we have an advocate with the Father. That advocate with the Father is a beautiful concept. The advocate is a word that you have heard before. Uh, It's a word, parakletos. Parakaleo. Para, along with. Kaleo, called. Called alongside. Paracoleto, we get a word paraclete from it. It's used about six times in Scripture, and all but one, it's referring to the Holy Spirit. This one is referring to God. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So here's what you've got. We live in a world of sin. We need to confess it. If we fail to confess it, that's okay because we can always confess it. We have an advocate with the Father. He's the cleanser of sin, the forgiver of sin, the helper when we do sin. And the gospel just continually amazes because God knows our weakness. He knows we are dust. So he gives us his help. He tells us that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. 2 Corinthians 5.19 A feminist theologian, her name is uh, Dolores Williams, she said, there's nothing divine in the blood of of the cross. Ooh. John Spong, S P O N G, an Episcopal bishop. Neither do I want a God who would kill his own son. Stephen Chalk, uh, 
says the orthodox understanding of the cross is a form of cosmic child abuse. A vengeful father punishing his son for an offense he has not committed is a twisted version of events morally dubious and a barrier to truth. <clears throat> Those folks are, boy, they're going to pay for what they said. Because here's the truth, and I'm finished with this. The truth is, there is a name that's above every name. There is a name whereby we can be forgiven of our sin. There's a name whereby the Arabs can be forgiven of their sin. There's a name by which the Israelis can be forgiven of their sin. There is one name where the whole world could be forgiven of sin if they only heard the message and knew that their darkness could be overcome because God is light. And because God is light, we can be forgiven. Thankfully, the light has not gone out. It still shines. And it shines if you'll simply come to Jesus. You can know the light. Well, you make it sound like I've got to confess every day. How often do you bathe? Yeah, sometimes in the summer, two or three times I shower. Because I not only does my body retain ice cream, it retains stink. It's just everywhere. And I want to clean up. And I do it by coming to Jesus. Coming. Coming just as I am. Come just as you are. Hear the Spirit call. Come just as you are. Come and see. Come receive. Oh, listen world. Come and live forever. Father in heaven, let this be our prayer. As we come to God who is light. Come to His Son who spoke light into existence. And we come by the power of the Spirit of God who has shown light in our soul. Oh Lord, let us come. Let us come now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing? Here we go. Come just as you are. Hear the Spirit call. Come just as you are, oh, come and see, come receive, come and live forever, life everlasting, and strength for today. Now won't you taste that living water and never thirst again? Come just as you are. Oh, hear the Spirit call. Come just as you are. Come receive Christ the King. Come and live forever. God bless you, brethren. Go out and shed the light on a foggy and dismal day because we have the light. <laughs>